and I'm staring at the ceiling and it just hit me. It was like, I need to get out of here. And I looked at the stars and I just said, all right, you know, God, universe, whatever, whoever's out there. If you get me through this, I will make it happen. I'm going to just play my sadness through the didgeridoo. And that was my pranayama. Like, that was my qigong. And my potential is my essence. Corey Costanzo is the co-owner of Still Point Wellness here in Asheville. He and his wife, Robin work there and they're both trained in Esalen massage which is what brought Corey out here from the west coast and still point is notable here in Asheville and around the country now for having an isolation tank a float tank which is a sensory deprivation type chamber with a salt water bath that you lie in and float and meditate and that's how I met Corey was through my experience with three floats a couple years ago, and I really benefited from the experience, and I enjoyed meeting him. So I knew he'd be an interesting guest for the podcast as this got started. He's also a clinical psychologist with specific training in somatic experience therapy, and he plays the didgeridoo. And those sounds you're hearing are the sounds of Corey and Robin leading a restorative yoga class at the Leaf Festival in Black Mountain earlier this spring. And later, you're going to get to hear Corey playing the didgeridoo, which is a uniquely fascinating instrument that seems to tap into all kinds of cosmic vibrations. And Corey's had an interesting journey. He's going to share with you some of his struggles with panic attacks, and in particular, a traumatic experience in Thailand. And he's grown from that, and I appreciate what he shared with me in our conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. So here it is, my conversation with Corey Costanzo. You got a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge over there? Yeah. 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 I love walking across the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things to do in, yeah. in Manhattan. So are you from up there? Yeah, from Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah. yeah I grew up in Mill Basin, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, all the way that so that's like right by Flappish Avenue near Fla- it's you know a block or two away from Flappish Avenue on the Brooklyn side that that bridge so if you take Flappish Avenue all the way down until basically you hit you hit the other side of Brooklyn yeah I was born 5009 Avenue M okay yeah, yeah. it's a native native uh-huh. uh, yeah my parents uh, came over on a boat from southern Italy Really? When they were teenagers. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's like the old story. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Like the early 20th century type story. And that's... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so they really came over on the boat from southern Italy. Yeah, they did. My dad from Sicily and my mom uh, from a town called Barile, which is where the heel would be, central southern Italy. Yeah. Okay. And they met at a, in a pizzeria. Uh huh. That my dad was working in. <laughs> oh wow! What and, a classic story. They yeah. met in in Italy. No, here. Yeah, okay. They met here. They so met they here. both came over on a boat separately. Yeah. Separately. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And ended up here meeting here at a pizzeria. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In Brooklyn, New York. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What a what a classic American story. Totally. Totally yeah. classic. Speak Italian in the house when you were growing up. They did, and every time I'd speak it. Um, there'd be laughter in the background and that made me really shy to speak it. So I grew up not speaking it, uh-huh. um, but it was in my field. So I, and I always took it in school, hmm. sixth grade through college. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was learning how to read and write Italian, but I still would rarely speak it. And then I studied in Florence for a semester when I was in, in undergraduate school and within two months, I was almost fluent. I was nearly fluent. Yeah. 
he picked it up quick and really all, quick. all that teaching yeah. kind of sinks in i guess when you're over there yeah yeah and it makes me think it makes me think you know why that that in the field you know growing up in the field of anything um i think makes us more likely to take on those skills that we were that we were that was happening in the field of of us growing up so i think that's why you see so many uh, children of doctors or lawyers will become doctors or lawyers right or um you know great musicians and actors and their children will go on to become come similar yeah similar fields and yeah i think it's because when we live in this field of possibility then we just know that that that's possible and mm-hmm. it's more likely to be so mhm it's almost like our our beliefs you know it's it's uh that whatever field we're living in and the people that are living around us are part of this field and and you know we take on traits and characteristics and thinking patterns and beliefs of of what's possible uh-huh. and and we're more likely to to make that manifest yeah you've thought about that before <laughs> i have yeah i have uh-huh. yeah okay so, so what did your yeah. parents do so my dad uh my dad owned pizzerias hmm. while i was growing up mm-hmm. and um my mom was a was a was a house mom for the first few years and then she went back to school as an adult and got her undergraduate degree and then her graduate degree in guidance and counseling and she became a guidance counselor oh, cool. at high school and she was also she was a substitute teacher for a while at the middle school that I went to and um one great thing that my mom did was she started a uh, a cosmetology program at an inner city high school um she also cut hair on the side mm-hmm. so um so in that in that cosmetology program kids students were able to get their full license by the time they graduated high school. So it was a vocational program that she started from the ground up and within the 4 years of high school she graduated many many students that otherwise would not have graduated with much uh, job opportunities or skills. Um she was able to to really help them out. She's she's a much loved woman in the community and did some great things for for many people. Yeah, like real tangible skills and yeah. connecting them to the next phase. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and and my dad, I mean, talk about a success story. My dad wound up uh well, my parents wound up investing in real estate. Oh, okay. You know, so classic classic uh American dream story. Right. You know, so so they would um they would put their money into real estate basically. And the very last the very last business that my dad bought was a soul food restaurant downtown Brooklyn right around the corner from Central Booking, you know. I'm taking you downtown. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It was, it was it was it was I'm taking you downtown and around the corner from Frank's Delicatessen. <laughs> <laughs> so so he bought this soul food restaurant breakfast and lunch were his main were his main meals and he created he, he kept the short order cook from who was from down south and he added uh pizza and italian food so it was a soul food slash pizza joint that was right across the street from one of the most dangerous ghetto housing projects uh in brooklyn and uh, the fort green projects and Right, right around the corner from Central Booking, and there were a whole host of characters that used to walk in. And my dad was always a, a, a well, he still is today, loved by all his friends and and people around him. But especially then, you know, he had people coming in. He would cash their welfare checks a couple weeks before, you know, before they were able to. And he yeah. was well loved in the community. Uh huh. Yeah. And then, you know, like I say, the American Dream story, just with a stroke of the pen, overnight they rezone the district. And and they um and they sent them a letter saying, "Oh, you know, now the building that you own, which was a one-story building, can now be built up to 10 stories high." Hmm. So that raised the property value 
mm-hmm. you know, triple, quadruple, I don't know, times five or six or whatever it was, it, it yeah. significantly raised the property value. Mm-hmm. So he wound up, that was basically his retirement. Nice. Was was that, that really wonderful um, business decision to buy that building and, and mm-hmm. put his sweat equity and labor and love into the business and into the building and then... And then years later, he turned around and sold it, and there was his retirement. Yeah. Do they still live up that way? They do, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Still yeah. in Brooklyn. Still in Brooklyn. We go twice a year to visit. So how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have uh, one brother and one sister. Okay. Yeah. And you are which? I'm the youngest. You're the youngest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the baby, as they say. The yep. baby, the mm-hmm. quintessential baby. Uh huh. So did all of y'all uh, kind of help out in the restaurants growing up? Or? My brother did more than I did. Okay. Yeah. Your mom, the educator, kind of made sure you were in school. And what was school like? School was fantastic, actually. I worked really hard in high school. I was really into it. In junior high school, I didn't work that hard. I... I broke a lot of rules and sure. still had fun and worked hard enough you know yeah. to get to get good enough grades to stay in some of the honors classes and and you know but i i didn't put forth much of an effort in junior high school and then high school hit and i just really found my found my love actually it wasn't really a love for learning it was more of a competitive edge sure, <laughs> that yeah. I was looking for in high school. And mm-hmm. my brother went to an Ivy League college. So oh, okay. it was my dream to go to an Ivy League college as well, following yeah. his footsteps. Wow, that's setting the bar high. Yeah. 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 I went to I went to I went to an inner city, inner city public school system um, throughout my throughout my school years. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's that sounds like kind of a classic American story that I feel like I've seen in a number of TV shows and movies, you know, Brooklyn High School, I don't know, Welcome Back, Cotter. Or <laughs> yeah. So what was, what was it like? I mean, was it tough? Was it dangerous? Well, it was, I'd say, yeah. um, for, for some of the years, not all the years, but my, my freshman year of high school, there were, there were horrible race riots lots of people would get jumped on a regular basis and someone got killed As a result, there were there were lots of lots of police that would that would patrol the high school. And mm-hmm. what time frame are we talking about here? This is 1987. 1987. So we're about the same age. I'm 41. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. I'm 42. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I get to high school, and there are these horrible race riots. My best friend got jumped by 50 other kids, put mm. in the hospital. Mm. Um, I got my chain stolen, mm-hmm. um, surrounded by six six other six other kids, and um, and the high school had a very creative way uh, to deal with the problem, which was actually very effective. So they brought in the outward bound program that mm. that you may have heard about. Yeah, um, one of these nature based therapeutic adventure programs. Yeah. And they brought an outward bound, and they took a black kid, a white kid, a Puerto Rican kid, a a black girl, and and you know a little bit of of every race and ethnicity, and um, different uh, socioeconomic scales were represented. And there was probably about a group of ten of us that, on a regular basis, almost every weekend, they would just stick us in the woods together. Mm-hmm. And have us do all sorts of activities, and I remember my favorite one was um, cross country skiing with fifty pound backpacks on our back and setting up tents in the snow. Oh wow! You know, really amazing experiences for an inner city kid like 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 myself to have. You know, when you're yeah. out there and and you're fighting the elements, then just race doesn't really matter. 
Yeah, I mean, all your reference points are gone. All the things that you've got, that your survival points of how to survive high school, a tough high school. Yeah. You know, now it's all of a sudden how do you survive the elements? And yeah, yeah. So and that was a big influence on you. Big influence on me, and as a result. I'd be walking in the halls and I'd, you know, just after a long, strenuous weekend of hiking with kids that I otherwise wouldn't be spending spending time with, you know, I'd be walking in the halls and, you know, Bigga, who was actually, actually a crack dealer in the school, um, and, you know, he'd walk right up to me and give me a big high five and a big hug and, you know, we'd just part, part ways and just the magic of bringing influential um, key people in the community of the school together in that creative way. Um, really, it took about six months and the riot stopped mm. and the race relations in the school really turned around and, and I attribute it to the Outward Bound program that they so brilliantly brought in. It was a, a very sustainable way to deal with the problem and a very humanistic way to deal with the problem. Yeah. So you were, you were one of those key figures, I guess. I was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What yeah. was your niche? I would say I was a little bit of a jock, a little bit of, of the smart kid. I was in, I was in a special accelerated, uh, scholars. They called it the scholars Institute program. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I was the sophomore year. I was the captain of the soccer and golf teams. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, this was freshman year, so I wasn't yet the captain, but I was playing soccer. I was playing golf. Uh huh. And, um, so there's some glimpses outside the city if you're playing golf, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not all. Well, it's still a Brooklyn golf course. Yeah. <laughs> right. Public, right. Brooklyn public golf course. Sure. But, yep. but yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. There was some some nature actually the neighborhood that i grew up in we had backyards and lawns uh-huh and it was it was it was a fairly um middle to upper middle class nice nice neighborhood yeah are there hipsters there now no uh the hipsters haven't quite come in yet that's on yeah. the other side that's that's closer to the brooklyn bridge okay yeah uh, right okay so high school you're doing well in school mm -hmm. learning from the outward bound program and you know, you got your competitive edge going in sports and working towards college. Where, where'd you end up going to college? I wound up going to the University of Vermont. Yeah? Yeah. That holds a special place in my heart. I'm a fish fan, so. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. I've eaten, uh, Nectar's was, a, was I, uh, a regular Friday and Saturday night gravy fries with, with cheese. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I could go on and on about nectars and what's the front that was another one the front right i don't remember the front okay well i don't either i mean i've never even been to burlington but uh -huh. i've heard a lot about it and heard a lot of shows from up there um okay so that's i've always wanted to go you know yeah, it sounds a like a cool place yeah it was a beautiful place it was a it was a super cool place and and, and just totally flipped my reality yeah Really, I mean, sure. I was you know being part of the Outward Bound program. I was part of I was part of nature, so it wasn't the biggest leap. But to really, to really leave the inner city and go to a school like UVM um, was a, a was a definite one eighty. Yeah, and upon reflection of my life, I've done that many times. I'll just flip mm. my reality, mm. and I think it's part of my personality that that really helps keep things fresh, keeps things exciting. So many times when I have in my waking life now, when I have any kind of issue or problem or I'm feeling stuck or I'm doing the same thing and, and, and expecting different results but they're not happening, I'll just 100% flip and change. Like I'll do the exact opposite of what I normally do now and that's as a result of having those early formative experiences where i did that and it was amazing for me mm -hmm. do you remember like one of those experiences like a time yeah, when well another big time was when i was in college and i was going through i was going through a period of depression it was really the first time that i had ever touched depression and maybe later on i'll talk a little bit about 
about periods of other periods of my life where, where I've experienced depression and experienced anxiety so much so to where I was I was um, I was I was given a diagnosis of panic disorder and agoraphobia so so I've I've spent some time in my life in those uh, dysregulated states, those emotional states where the world feels like it's just crashing in on me. And the first time that it really happened to me uh, was when I was in college. And I remember just lying in bed. My friends were all going out to see B.B. King at this Mm -hmm. small venue, and I didn't go. And I loved B.B. King. And, um, And I'm staring at the ceiling, And it just hit me. It was like, I need to get out of here. Someone had once said to me, you need to do a semester abroad. So I started researching it and you know within a few months I was on an airplane going to spend the next semester in Florence, Italy and that really took me to to a whole new uh, part of my life really it opened doors for me in ways that that I never could have imagined. So in a way if I had not experienced that contraction that period of discomfort that period of my life during college where I was downright clinically depressed, then it, it, it wouldn't have opened the doors that opened for me Yeah, in the, in the Italy experience. Sure. Something in you was itching for something different, perhaps. Did you have relatives in Florence? Not in Florence, but I have relatives all over Italy. Uh-huh. Yeah. And my parents love to be host to a lot of distant relatives from Italy, so... Um, yeah. So lots of them will come to New York City, and my parents will um, give them give them a great time and really show a lot of presence and love and be very generous and kind with them. So um, naturally, they all wanted to do the same. So weekends, I would go and I would and I would spend with family all over Italy. I think yeah. that's another reason why I started speaking Italian fluently so quickly. Yeah. Yeah, you got family over there. Yeah. So I'm sure your parents were were pleased with your decision to to go to Italy and study over there. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. must have been pretty cool. Yeah. Did your brother and sister do that too? Or? They didn't. No, yeah. but my sister came with my younger cousin at the time to visit, and they stayed for about a month. Yeah. So that was pretty precious, and we got to um, go down south, and my grandmother took a trip over to visit her sister. They were maybe in there. 70s at the time so I got to see them and hang out with my grandmother and her sister where where they used to live as children mm. wow the motherland the motherland <laughs> yeah, yeah right true. yeah I went to Florence when right before I started med school and that was that and the Cinque Terre were the only places in Italy I went to but oh my gosh it's just so beautiful and you know David's there and Uffizi Gallery and the birth of Venus and all that. Those are memories that are kind of trickling through as I'm thinking. So that was, that was a big experience for you being in Florence. Were you there for a semester, for a year? I was there for a semester and then I stayed on another three months. I did a solo, a solo tour around Europe with, with the train and had, had lots of wonderful experiences yeah. and, um, and then spent two solid months with, uh, with family on a coastal town on the Adriatic Riviera called Cesanatico. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah and, and that was a fantastic couple of months. I had a great community of, of uh, friends that I tapped right into. Uh-huh. And yeah, so, so that, experience, that experience really was my first taste of, of, of f- well, my second taste. My first taste of flipping my reality was, um, was leaving Brooklyn yeah. and, uh, and going to UVM. And then my second taste was was leaving Burlington for a semester and going and going to Italy. Yeah, the world's getting a little bigger. Yeah, a lot bigger, just growing. Do you remember the feeling? You know, was it like a courage to break through? You just knew you had to kind of break out of your shell. Is that? 
uh, or was it uh, feeling trapped where you were perhaps? You know, I was, I was definitely feeling trapped. I, I was feeling like I wasn't tapped into my essence. Mm. I was feeling like I have got a lot to offer those around me. And right now, I can't figure out how to tap into that wellspring of juicy, delicious, fun, uh, exciting stuff. <laughs> yeah, the good stuff. The good stuff. The good stuff. It wasn't flowing. So yeah, yeah, I felt I felt very I felt very trapped. And there have been other times in my life where I felt where I felt very trapped as well. And on a day to day basis, there are moments in my day where I feel trapped. Yeah. So this whole flipping my reality thing um, has become a way of life for me. I mean, as simple as changing my breathing patterns. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm if I'm feeling stuck on a project, um, I'll just take take a minute and I'll just walk outside and I'll do breath of fire. You know, yeah. or I'll, uh, you know, where you just breathe really fast in and out in a certain in a certain pattern, and sure enough, within a, within a matter of minutes, that'll just uh, flip my reality. It'll take me to a different uh, state of being in the present moment. And uh, playing the didgeridoo is another is another thing that I'll that I'll do to flip my reality and um, and, and and help expand my present moment possibility. Yeah, that's awesome. Because uh, working in mental health for for a dozen years now, the more that people talk about depression as a word, first off, the less I understand it really, you know, because it's kind of like, a, it means different things to different people. But one of the things that seems to be a common uh, experience with what people go through when they talk about depression is the feeling of being stuck or trapped and being able to take a fresh perspective on our situation. That's, that's the key. And, and to break through like that and just flip your reality as you put it and to see the other side of it or just see something different than the thought patterns that we're stuck in at that moment. That sounds like a useful technique that you picked up on. Did you come up with it on your own or somebody teach it to you? You know, I came up with it on my own and mm. my take on words to describe experience and diagnoses to describe experience, I felt like once I got my diagnosis in my mid-20s of panic disorder with agoraphobia, then I could put my thumb on it. I, then I can, the scariest thing for me to have had panic attacks was that I had no clue what they were. I had no clue until I got the diagnosis. And then, and then I read about it and I was like, oh, that's what it is. Okay, I could work with this. Now. Yeah. So when was the first one, of the first panic attack? So the first panic attack, um, it was probably in my, in my late, no, my mid-20s. Yeah. It's yeah. so common. That's when my first one was. Mm-hmm. I was 25, so it was probably about the same time you were going through yours. Right. Or, you know, within a few years. And it seems to be a real common time for yeah. panic attacks to begin. I'm not sure if it's biological or existential or some combination mm-hmm. of going through a transition in life. Yeah. Um, so do you remember the circumstances? I can tell you about my first one. I was, in, I was lost in Amsterdam and I uh, couldn't find my way back to the youth hostel I was staying in. Uh, this was right before I went to Florence, and I would stop and ask for directions, and people would say, go left, left, right, right, left, and I would follow them and end up more lost, and there was a gang of kids who was running around, chanting, and uh, it was just bewildering, and I felt like my heart was going to beat through my chest. I didn't have a way of getting in touch with anybody. I was there by myself, and all I wanted to do was just go get in the bed and I couldn't even find where that was. And then I eventually made it back. And when I did, that's what I did was I just got in the bed and I couldn't leave the youth hostel for, I mean, not quite 24 hours, but a long time. And I didn't know where to turn. And it just kind of stayed, that panic attack just stayed kind of off and on through the night. And then they started 
happening again uh, after I started med school and it became like a, a thing, you know, it became uh, an occurrence and I could start to feel it cook up. And then uh, when it would kick in, I felt helpless to it and it, would, it could start up at different times. And yeah, that, that, that was that was my first one and how it got going. So, I, you know, I was diagnosed with panic disorder uh, as well. Yep. And then I ended up seeing the psychiatrist at the School of Medicine, UNC School of Medicine, Dr. Alan Hamrick. And man, he helped me through it. Helped me through it big time. But I, that's that's another story for another day. That's just part of it. I was just... That's a little teaser. Yeah, that's a little teaser. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I remember like once it got going, it just yeah. the, the helpless feeling that went right. along with it. And I, I do think the diagnosis, having a term for it, helped me at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you were saying like having a term for it and knowing that it was a thing, you know, that you that had been studied perhaps, you know, right. gave you a sense of, okay, I can work with this. That's right. Yeah. And as you tell your story, which thanks for sharing, by the way, I appreciate yeah. that. It, um, it just dislodged the memory of my first panic attack, yeah. which was, um, <laughs> oddly enough, I was in a similar intense place as Amsterdam. Yeah. It, it was, I was in Ibiza. Spain. Oh yeah. The island okay. off the coast of Spain. Yep. It's known for many different for many different qualities. It's beauty, it's beaches, it's um cuisine and it's partying. Yeah. So it has these these the people from all over the world. I was I was heavily into the electronic music scene, the house music scene. Right. You know, as into fish that you were. Yeah. That's how into the club scene I was. I was a club promoter when I was living in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Um, so in my mid twenties, and, and that was the heyday of my club days. You know, adorned in Gucci and Prada and all these fabulous outfits, and you know, going to all the fabulous clubs and walking out of limousines and. And, you know, being ushered right in past the line of, of hundreds and hundreds of people waiting for hours to get into the club. And, and, yeah. and you had a crew of 50 or 60 uh, friends that, that we would all do it all, all together. So I go to Ibiza, which is the promised land of the club scene and the house music scene. And, um, and I remember hanging out with my girlfriend who had spent the entire summer there. So I was going to visit her and some of her friends and I remember we're all just sitting in a circle in someone's apartment before we're about to go to, go to one of the clubs. And out of nowhere, everything that people are saying, there's a little voice in my head that is the, this critic voice that is relating everything that they're saying to some negative aspect about me. Yeah. And... It started really freaking me out. It, that that had never happened before. So somebody would look at me and they'd smile and then they'd look at my girlfriend and smile. And in the back of my head, a little voice would say, he's got a crush on her. And after you leave, they're going to get together. And I'd be like, whoa, what is going on? And, and it got progressively worse and progressively worse and progressively worse. Mm-hmm. But that was the very first one. And it was suffering at its greatest. It was very, it was mentally painful. Yeah. Yeah. And then so yeah. fast forward over the next six months before I got the diagnosis, you know, it got so bad that I was asked to take two weeks off at work because I couldn't focus, I couldn't concentrate because this little voice in my head just start, you know, it kept telling me things that, um, that were negative. Yeah. It's really that simple. And yeah. finally, after six months of seeing a therapist, the therapist just gave me the number of a psychiatrist and said, please go see this guy. You do not need to suffer this much. And he was able to help me on my road to recovery, um, you know, through the right psychotropic um, uh, meds that helped to ease the suffering. Yeah. And I was able to do the work a deeper psychotherapeutic work because the suffering was eased and I was able to actually function and have my job. And, and then that lasted for about, for about a year that, that I was on those, those medications. And then I very slowly weaned off of them. 
Mm-hmm. And when I weaned off of them, ah, it was just, it was, it was, it was beautiful. Life was beautiful again. Yeah, that's, I mean, that just sounds so familiar. I had such a similar experience. Um, so you're in your mid twenties. So what, what happened from there? Yeah. So, yeah. so from there I wound up during this whole time during my twenties, I was working for a startup company in Manhattan called Delia's. I was maybe the I don't know, 15th or 20th employee and they wound up growing to 500 plus employees in yeah. the five years that I was there. And I was working really hard. I was actually right out of college. I was packing boxes in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. And I was able to see very, very quickly that uh, people, uh, which were family friends actually, that started the company were really smart and they they were going to be really successful. I was able to see that really, really fast. And it, it was an intuitive hit. Um, so much against my mother's um, thought of what I should be doing with my college education. Which was what? Which was going to law school or okay. going back to graduate school. Uh -huh. You know, I wanted practical experience. So my brother, who's seven years older than me and extremely generous, um, took me on as a roommate. Uh -huh. And uh, we lived in these really fun, huge lofts. He was making a lot of money at the time. Uh, so, well... I, it's all relative. He was making a lot more money than I was at the time. <laughs> yeah. and, and we would sublet for several years. We did this. We would sublet these huge furnished lofts downtown Manhattan. So it was perfect because it was my club days. I was having so much fun throwing these awesome fun parties. And I was also working really hard at the startup company. My brother was supplementing part of uh, my living expenses. Um, well, not my living expenses, but he was paying two-thirds of the rent. I was only paying one-third of the rent yeah. um, rather than splitting it 50-50. And uh, Delia's wound up really popping. And so, What kind of company is that? It was a young women's clothing catalog company. Okay. Yeah. Their market age was 12 to 24. And... So, so it was a cutting edge company. It was so much fun. I wound up actually in my mid twenties during the whole panic attack time, selling my stock options and getting a whole bunch of money that I rolled into after the panic attacks started. And then I got healthy. Then I basically sold the stock options and, um, you know, wound up traveling for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, not really a couple of years at that point. It was maybe six months. So I just traveled around the world. I went to Bali in Brazil. Wow. And that was where I learned how to play the didgeridoo, and, uh, which is a really important thing in my life, um, practice in my life, I should say. And then I came back to Manhattan and I rented out, uh, I, well, I bought an apartment with the money that was uh, slowly being spent, <laughs> or, or, or I should say quickly being spent. Yeah. So, so I rolled it into an apartment, um, which uh, you know, which was a fantastic business decision. It was at the right yeah. time, at the right place on West Twenty First Street between Seventh and Eighth Avenue in Chelsea. Oh wow! Right before it, the neighborhood popped. Yeah, and um, I sold it later, about about three or four years later, and tripled and tripled the investment. Wow! So it, I, I've been blessed, uh, totally blessed. Um, with making sound financial decisions and taking the right risks, such as you know working for eight dollars an hour with a college education, packing boxes because I believed that this company was going to really make it, which it did. So to answer your question, I am you know this is fast forwarding a couple of years now, and um, and I'm renting out my apartment for twice of what the mortgage was. So I'm actually saving money, and traveling around the world, and um, living off living off the money that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm making, renting out the apartment. And I'm traveling around with a woman um, that I had fallen in love with. And we get back from a trip from Brazil, and she winds up leaving me for an older man. Yeah, there it goes. You know. <laughs> there it goes. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. Jet set and traveling all over the world, and then the rug gets yanked out from under you. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's how life goes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There was some deception on her part, and um, and I remember just you know really being angry with her, like how could you do this? How could you lie to me? And you know all this all this stuff. And she said, you know what, Corey? That's just the way it went down. I'm really sorry, and one of these days you'll thank me. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I know. Not that day. <laughs> that's the last thing I want to hear. <laughs> yeah, right. But, I mean, it does seem that sometimes breakups, somebody's just got to have the courage to jump ship, I guess. That's but right. That's right. It, it never feels course. like it's a courageous decision when you're on the other end of it, yeah, you know? Yeah. Of course, I, of course, I thank her to this very day. Yeah. I thank her a million times over, a million times over, I thank her. Um, for following her heart, really, because yeah. that's what that's what she did. You know, mm-hmm. it could have been done with a little bit more honesty. Um, right, might have might have eased the pain. However, I think it's it's for me. It's a life truth. You know, the bigger the pain, the bigger the pain, the bigger the transformation. Once I work through the pain, it's mm. one of those paradoxes for me that has come true time and time again. And now. A little bit older and wiser, um, I don't fear the pain as much, I should say, <laughs> as I used to. Um, knowing this truth and this belief that I have mm-hmm. for my for myself, you know, the bigger the pain, the big, the more the suffering, the bigger the possibility for transformation, and um, you know, the brighter the rainbow, yeah, um, or the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, whatever it is. So this is how it happens. So she breaks my heart. Mm-hmm. And I start slipping into this this uh, feeling of panic attack again. Yeah, right. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, so at that point, I had my apartment in Chelsea, super fabulous apartment, rented out, um, and I moved back in with my parents. I'm in my late twenties, and I'm sleeping in an uncomfortable bed. And I found myself waking up in the mornings with this terrible sense of dread, this terrible closing in, trapped feeling that you speak about, this depression. I feel the panic coming on again. And I felt myself getting pulled down the rabbit hole, as I call it. Mm -hmm. The thoughts were starting to swirl into a negative space again. And it happened one morning, and I remember feeling, you know, just feeling the weight of the entire day and it didn't lift finally after a couple of mornings of that i'm in bed and i just remembered the whole flipping my reality thing you know from from college and i was like okay maybe i could just flip my reality now i I remember i remember this like it was yesterday Mm. so rather than fight against the suffering and the pain i just started going into it and i Mm -hmm. felt it in my belly that that was where i felt it the most and I just started breathing into it. Now, I had never done any kind of yoga or, or, or qigong or any of these practices that I now know of and practice today. Um, but I just intuitively just tried a little experiment. Yeah. And it was just, okay, how can I flip my reality on this situation? I was like, I am not going to let this beat yeah. me down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just went into it. And within about five breaths of yeah. going into it, like nuclear explosions started happening in my belly and they and it started traveling up to my chest and down to my feet and out my arms and it was streams of energy streams of i mean i didn't know that it was energy but it was sensation let's just say streams of sensation and i started breathing deep and breathing heavy and then i just jumped out of bed i didn't have a choice i couldn't stay in bed yeah. I jumped out of bed. I called a friend of mine from high school that was living around the block at the time and at, at, had actually just gotten dumped himself. And I said, I need to go run. Will you come run with me? He came to run with me. And we just ran and ran and ran. And it felt so good. And it felt so healthy. And it felt so energizing that for the rest of the summer, every single morning, we would work out and run together for four hours. Mm. It was a magical time in our friendship. It was a magical time in my life. And then I was on a quest to figure out what just happened. Yeah. What, how did I do that? What did I do? How, 
what happened physiologically, what happened, what happened uh, mentally, emotionally. And that was when I started, um, you know, picking up these books that I had never read before, the esoteric healing arts. And that was when I um, started uh, taking body work courses to figure it out. That was when I, when I happened upon the Esalen Institute, you yeah. know, which will be the next chapter in our, in our conversation. twenties, early thirties at this point. Is, is that right? Uh, late twenties. Late twenties still. Okay. And you mentioned Esalen. Yeah. Okay. And that's pretty timely because, you know, it was just a couple of weeks ago that the Mad Men finale happened. That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> so that's, um, that's fresh in my, uh, retina from, from watching that episode where they're actually at the Esalen Institute, right? Yeah. And that's the first time I'd ever seen it like yeah. visually. So, should we talk about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so here I am living at my parents' house, spending the entire summer working through this newfound relationship to my body, which is staying with sensation and really enjoying the feeling of these nuclear explosions of energy that for the first time really ever is causing me to work out and lift weights and run and really coming into my body, yeah. being embodied. So I was, I was slowly becoming embodied. And, and in my research to try to figure out what was going on, I found craniosacral therapy and massage. Hmm. Um, so a very dear friend and ex-girlfriend of mine from my Delia's days and days of um, club promoting in Manhattan. We were together for five years. Actually, she was the woman that I had spoken about that moved to Ibiza for that, for that summer. Yep. So we were sitting in a cab together on 14th Street, downtown Manhattan, and I was helping her get a, get a television uh, from PC Richard and, and, and Sons, and we're sitting in the cab, and the big television is right, right in between us, and, and I'm telling her how, how I'm not exactly sure how what I want to do, but I feel this energy inside that I want to understand these sensations in my body that I, I really want to, want to understand. And, and she said, well, you know, my new boyfriend is a massage therapist <laughs> and I think you would really like massage. You should think about becoming a massage therapist. And as soon as she said it, my entire body just started vibrating and I couldn't control the tears coming out of my eyes and I knew right there and then that I needed to pursue body work, massage and body work. So I was on my quest then. That was like the next light on the path that lit up. And it just lit my path. And that's the way I, that's my philosophy of life now. When I'm present, when I'm paying attention, I can just, I can just feel into the moment and I know which way to go. And I know what decision to make because I just I just feel into it and inevitably the light will shine on the path of where I'm supposed to move to next. And sometimes it might take a few minutes or a few hours or a few days, but you know, through the practice of meditation and the practice of mindfulness, you know, that I've cultivated over the last 12 or 13 years. That's how I make my decisions now. So there was there was the, the next light on my path to pursue massage, massage and body work. Um, so I actually signed up for the Finger Lake School of Massage, which is in in uh, New York, with with the plan of doing a year long program there and then moving back to Manhattan and starting and starting to do massage professionally. Uh huh. And a friend had called me up and said, you know, I was on my honeymoon in Big Sur. And uh, Big Sur, California, and I tried to get into this place called the Esalen Institute. 
It looks beautiful, and I just kept thinking of you, and I just want to let you know you might want to check it out. Yeah. So I check it out online, and this is this is when the internet was like kind of just getting traction. So you know, I look online. They had a website, and I was blown away, absolutely blown away with this place that I was now exposed to, um, Esalen dot org e s a l e n dot o r g if you're interested to just check it out and and what I learned was that they they host teachers from all over the world in all different kinds of workshops and modalities and 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 life enhancing things that they call uh, human potential workshops and they have been doing so since the early sixties. And super heavy hitters in sh- psychology, Fritz Perls, the founder of Gestalt Psychology, lived there and developed his theories. Abraham Maslow, uh, one of our greatest uh, philosophers, um, Buckminster Fuller. You know, a lot of these books that I see in your shelf over here <laughs> yeah. um, were authored by people that studied, lived, taught at the Esalen Institute. And literally within two hours, my application for a work scholar month uh, was put in. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's quick. It's quick. It was yeah. really quick. It was yeah. really, really fast. It was yeah. really, really fast. Wow. One of the things that jumps out from that story is that the feeling that you had was in your body, and that's what led you to act. And yet we call that mindfulness when it's actually quieting the thoughts, you know? That's just kind of paradoxical, but it seems yeah. to be, you know, the therapeutic route. Yeah. There's this great word that I learned from a friend of mine who wrote this book in 1977, and he coined the term body-mind. Mm. And so the body-mind is um, basically the mind-body connection, and what he says is that our our bodies, our musculature, our different systems of the body, they take on a, an inherently wise uh, mind. It, it's actually... It holds memory. So our our physical structures hold memory. They hold it holds trauma. Yeah. Well, you you know a lot about this now, but let's let's go back to when yeah. when you started up at Esalen. You know, you'd been just kind of following these sensations and working your way through, you know, difficult life experiences through intuition and trust in your body and trust in people around you. But you know, then you make you make the jump and you actually go to Esalen straight out. That was the the first experience in the healing arts professionally that you worked into? Yeah, that's right. So I got to Esalen with the intention of doing of doing one month long workshop in spiritual massage, which is, to put it very simply, it's similar to something like Reiki. And um, same, same, but different. Yeah. Right. And within within a couple of weeks, I, I see that um, I need to be at Esalen that I need to be there long term. And I apply for a year long internship, learning how to cook in the kitchen. And um, when you live there and work there as an intern, you can take the catalog workshops as many as you can fit into your schedule at a deeply discounted rate. Um, And I got accepted into that program. The, which program is this? The the year long internship program. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They called it an extended student at the time. Okay. And um, that's how you get started out there. Well, you get started as a either paying paying for a workshop, okay. um, or going as a personal retreat just for the day or the night, or as a work scholar where you go for a month or I think it's five weeks now, and you pay, and you get room and board. And you pay about $1,000, and you also get a month-long workshop, and okay. you're part of the community. Okay. So you'd gotten that first I month-long that deal, first. and then you applied yeah. for the year-long internship. Yeah, and, and I got it. And then what? Well, then I met my wife. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then, then I met my wife. Okay. Yeah. So um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack a little bit. Sure. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, and I forget where this uh, this event happened along the timeline. It was somewhere after the whole body-based transformation of anxiety into energy, that whole realization. It was after that, but it was before Esalen. 
So it was one of these trips that I took where I was renting out my apartment. So I was financially set and I was making more money. So I had income to spend and I was traveling all over the world. One of the places I went to was Thailand to study body work and see if body work was going to be um, a field that I really wanted to get certified and licensed in. So I went to Thailand and I did you know, a month long or so program in Thai, in Thai massage. And I wound up getting into a horrific motor scooter accident where the other guy on the scooter was a head-on collision with another scooter where he wound up dying. Oh my gosh. It was, uh, yeah, and it was the middle of the night and a friend of mine was on the back of the bike and luckily she didn't get hurt at all whatsoever. It was in the middle of rice paddy fields, you know, mm. and, um, you know, she's over me telling me, you know, this guy's in a pool of blood. Um, mm. uh, I was lying in the middle of the road and I couldn't move. And, you know, it was, it was, it was quite, it was quite traumatic. And I leaned back, I leaned back and I just looked up at the stars and I made a pact with the heavens. I just made a pact and it became really clear what I needed to do when I made that pact because I, I just had to just lie there and surrender. I didn't know if I was injured to the point of being paralyzed or what. I, I knew I couldn't feel my lower half. I couldn't, um, I couldn't move, you know. And, um, and I looked at the stars and I just said, all right, you know, God, universe, you know, who, whatever, whoever's out there, if you get me through this, I will make it happen. right there and then like those three words and they're still very i have a t-shirt that says make it happen now um and i knew right there and then that it was my duty to make it happen and that essence that i spoke about beforehand that led to my first depression of not being in contact with the essence for me make it happen meant you need to realize your potential it yeah. needs to happen so make it happen and my potential is my essence. Like the world just seeing my essence and feeling my essence and feeling my love and feeling my beauty and my enjoyment of life and my enjoyment of pain and my enjoyment of suffering. When I say enjoyment, because of this belief system of suffer, my suffering leads to my transformation. So now, now I'm able to flip suffering on its head when it happens. So I say that it's enjoyable because I just wait for the beauty that the suffering turns into so make it happen for me so i tell this story because within the next six months so six months later fast forward six months from lying in the middle of the road in this in this horrific accident which which by the way i had to prove my innocence i was almost on trial for murder in thailand mm. i had to get a lawyer i had to turn myself into the police i had to prove my innocence which all took took a couple of weeks before they exonerated me um, and, and, and you know they were gonna possibly ch charge me with the crime. Um, mm -hmm. And then I wound up going to the guy's funeral, which was you know written up in the Bangkok, this was in Chiang Mai, and it was written up in the Bangkok newspaper. It was a really super big deal. There were hundreds and hundreds of people at the funeral, and you know we were the only Caucasian people there, and it was, it was quite an experience. So wow. fast forward six months, and I am living at, at the Esalen Institute. I'm learning how to be a chef. I'm, I'm in grad school for, yeah. for uh, clinical psychology with a concentration in somatic body psychology. I'm certified as an Esalen massage practitioner. I am, I am engaged to be married. I've got a kid in the belly. Whoa. All within six months. Oh, my God. And I was happier than I than I ever dreamed that I would be in Big Sur, California, at a hot springs 
human potential movement, um, you know, groundbreaking retreat center on the cliffs of Big Sur where the mountains meet the ocean. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of change in six months. That's a lot of change in six months. Yeah. Yeah. And so you had this message that was given back to you or that you, you felt that was make it happen. That's right. That's right. It was like, it was like enough already. It wasn't even like enough already. Like, you know, it was like, make it happen. You yeah. want to get through this? Your pact is that you need to make it happen. Yeah. And I was like, done. <laughs> I was like, done. And then yeah. I just, and I just, I just laid back on the concrete in the middle of the road and I just had a smile on my face and I just knew it was this inner knowing. I just knew that I was going to make it through. Mm. I just knew. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a powerful run of events there. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'm just trying to uh, kind of catch up with that in my mind. So, um, and that's just from hearing the story. So, you know, you're, you're, you went through that traumatic event in Thailand and, well, that makes sense also why you, you went straight for the Esalen when you heard of it. You were really yeah. clear about uh, actualizing your potential at that point. It That's was, right. It was a mandate. It was a mandate. Yeah. yeah. And so, well, well, what a great place to learn at Esalen. Yeah. And you were able to kind of work your way into the community there, which is probably pretty tough to get into. And uh, But then you're learning all this fantastic stuff. And you said you, you met your wife. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she had been living there for about 15 years at the time. And oh, wow. She taught Esalen massage, and she was on the bodywork crew. Her mom, uh, her mom was living there also at the time for just as long, and she was cooking in the kitchen. Her brother was living there as well. He was running the, the art barn. He created and was running, was running the art barn and was bringing all art, art workshops. Yeah. And there you go, and, and you join the clan. I join the clan, the <laughs> Fan Clan. Oh, yeah, that's, right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's their last name, Fan, F-A-N-N, so the Fan Clan. Uh-huh, okay. And so you're, things are in motion now. Th- things are in motion. I get Ooh. really drawn to craniosacral therapy, okay. and, um, and, the, and I, I started noticing how profound of a shift people were making with subtle body work, subtle touch that involved the emotional body. And mm. there's, a, uh, there's a level, when you learn craniosacral therapy, you learn it in levels. And one of the levels is SER, somatic emotional release. Okay. And I had some amazing, you know, the beautiful thing about learning body work is that it's all experiential learning. Mm. So that's how you learn. You feel it yourself. You feel it yourself and you go through it yourself. And when I was younger, I used to um, do these behaviors that I guess were coping mechanisms for just dealing with life as a kid. But, you know, I used to pull my hair. Yeah. I, I used to, um, you know, do do behaviors like like that, bite my tongue and mm-hmm. and uh, blink. And I used to stutter as well mm. as, as a young child. And... Um, so I processed through some of the stuck, the stuck patterns of blinking and stuttering and hair pulling on the table and had some incredible sessions emotionally of getting that stuck patterns out of my body. And it felt so good and it was so freeing that I needed to know more. And that was another light that lit my path. And it was, it was very easy to make the decision to go to graduate school for clinical psychology because I saw the power in touch to facilitate emotional release. So I thought, I'll go for the gold standard, and, uh, you know, which was a, a degree in clinical psychology with a uh, concentration in somatic psychology or body-centered psychology. Yeah, cool. Where where'd you go for that? I went to the Santa Barbara Graduate Institute okay. and it was um it was the first graduate school in the world to offer doctoral degrees in pre and perinatal psychology. 
mm. and uh, which is psychology of the of the of the time preconception to two years. So conception, and then the psychology of birth, and yeah. what happens in the fetus, what happens in vitro. You know, there's all this wonderful body of work that's out there now. That's that's uh, that's really interesting, and um, and the school was cutting edge. It was a fantastic education that I received uh, that was mainly experiential based. Um, so we did we did a lot of a lot of our own personal work, which is about a year of weekly personal therapy in order to graduate there. Yeah, that's an important part of the psychotherapy training. Your own work. Yeah, your own work. Uh, you got to start there. So, okay, so then so you added the graduate degree yep. to the mix. And then what? Added the graduate degree to the mix and um, started started doing my first internship working in Salinas, California, which is... Um, Steinbeck country, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Steinbeck country. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gang country as well. Yeah. Okay. So, in, in modern society. That's yeah. What, yeah. Right. And, um, and then we were in Big Sur. I was in Big Sur for a total of six years. And mm. then we wanted to buy a house. Um, and it was at the time where, where the housing prices were ridiculously inflated all over the country. Um, so we started looking at other smaller cities and we started looking at the possibility of relocating to another city. We found Asheville and f quickly fell in love with it. And en route to moving here, we wound up um, finding out that we were pregnant with our second child. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. And then our Asheville journey began and it's been six years now that we've been in, been in Asheville. And Take it to the direction of what you're doing now, because yeah. uh, we got to talk about the float tank. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so how did this idea come about? Yeah, my daughter's best friend's dad approaches me and my wife, and um, he knew our story of moving out to the east to bring Esalen massage. The Esalen Institute is one of the birthplaces of Western massage. And there's a type of massage called the Esalen massage that is really incredible. And it's very popular on the, on the West Coast. It's very popular actually in Germany and mm. in Japan as well and in Bali. And nobody knows about it in the South. So one of the reasons why we moved out here was to bring Esalen massage and the modality here. So my wife, Robin Fan, teaches it and certifies body workers in, in this incredible modality of massage. Um, so he knew about our massage background and he really wanted to bring floating to Asheville. He had floated when he was 18 years old. This is your father-in-law? Uh, no, sorry. This is the father of my daughter's friend. Oh, okay. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who was also a friend of mine. Yeah. Okay. And actually loves fish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good for him. <laughs> It was actually at my second fish show in Charlotte uh, three years ago or so. Oh, yeah. That, I was uh, at that show. <laughs> yeah. That he proposed to me t to run the spa. Okay. And I'll get to that in a second. So he knew about our body work. He knew about Robin's reputation and her ability to train body workers and to offer world-class massage and body work. So just a little aside, um, Robin is an incredible body worker. She was inducted into the Massage World Hall, World Massage Hall of Fame. Wow. With people fly her all over the world to teach Esalen massage. Rock she's, star She's massage. a rock star yeah, of massage. Yeah. In fact, she was on Lollapalooza tour <laughs> in, the, in the late 90s, um, Backstage massaging the Lollapalooza tour. Yeah, okay. Um, so she, yeah, she's she can she can actually say she is a rock star. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, so so he basically says to Robin and I, hey, listen, I'm going to build a spa and and bring a, fl a float tank to Asheville, and and I want you guys to run it, and okay. eventually buy me out. 
And we're like, yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah, yeah, all right, talk to us, talk to us later on. And little by little, he'd, he'd be like, oh, what's your favorite color? And, and oh, what's, what's your favorite massage table? And we didn't really put it together that he was actually going ahead and doing it. And then at the fish show, um, driving home, he turns to me and he says, your spa is, all, is all ready for you. Oh, my gosh. And I'm like, <laughs> really? And he's like, yeah. He's like, come and float in the float tank. The colors are on the wall. The floor is down. The build-out's done. I want you guys to run it. And then, you know, whenever you're ready, you'll just buy me out. And, uh, you know, it's my gift to Asheville. This is my gift to you guys. And uh, I was still a little incredulous is a good word. I was incredulous until I floated in the float tank. So I get in, and and my first float was good. But it was the second float that really did it. Mm-hmm. So I get in, and the spa is beautiful, by the way. You know, I, I, I walk in, I couldn't believe what he did with the place. Um, mm. it, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And so, so I get into the float tank, and I have this thought as I'm floating there. And it's a big float tank, by the way. It's about eight feet tall, and there's only 12 inches of saltwater solution in there. So it's more like a big chamber. It's eight yeah. feet long. You could really spread eagle in there. Yeah big door, you know, easy out. And I have this thought that what if he forgot to turn the air on? You just suffocate. (laughs) You just suffocate. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Um, You just breathe the air. It's not a closed system. So you can live forever in the float tank without the air turned on. The air is just like the cherry on top. It's just a hospital-grade air scrubber that, that filters the air in a very professional way and sends in fresh air. Yeah. So it, in my mind, I was going to die, in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so all of a sudden, you know, your ears are underneath the water when yeah. you float. Your nose and your eyes and half your body floats on top of the water as if you're in, floating in the Dead Sea. Um, so I'm in the float tank, and all of a sudden my heart starts pounding, and I'm having this thought, what if the air is not turned on? And literally, I mean, I hadn't had a panic attack in 10 years, and I was headed towards a panic attack. Yeah. And and I hear boom, 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 my heart is pounding. And all of a sudden I start hearing this sound. Quit, 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 quit. And of course I'm thinking I'm self-diagnosing leaky heart valve. Like, <laughs> what's going on here? One of the great things about floating is that it's a biofeedback tool. So you can actually hear some you can hear your heartbeat. You can hear some of your inner processes going on when when you get really still and really and really quiet. But for me, it was it was scary, and so all of a sudden, I start thinking about the stress response and what's actually happening, and you know, knowing what I know about somatic psychology and the stress response and anxiety, I start thinking backwards and working backwards. So I'm like, okay, so my heart is beating really fast right now, moving blood to the extremities so that we can fight or flee. And that's what keeps us alive, and that's what keeps us out of danger and safe. I was like, but the danger is only in my head. I was like, so if the heart is beating faster and the blood is is going to my extremities right now because of this thought that I'm in danger, then that must that sound must be the blood going through my veins. And I realized that the quit 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 was the blood going through my veins. And I thought it was the coolest thing, to, yeah, to be able to. To, to, to watch this whole cycle, this whole mechanism of what causes a panic attack and what I've learned about, but to actually watch it and experience it from the inside out. And when I realized that, I said, oh, here's an opportunity to flip my reality. So let me try to flip my reality right now. What if I can supplant a positive thought and just, just don't worry about this negative thought about the air? So... So I just started thinking, all is well, all is well, all is well. And within the third all is well, the sound went away, my heartbeat regulated and was just really soft and gentle and slow. And in my mind's eye, it was almost as if I was floating in this disc of, of yellow light and I just felt blissed out. Yeah. And I thought to myself that, oh, this is this. I imagine this is what it's like when the Buddha says that he's reached enlightenment. I, I was like, I was, I, I was literally, I was feeling lighter. I wasn't yeah. feeling the weight and the heaviness of being what I call pulled down the rabbit hole. I was feeling light. 
Yeah. I was feeling like I could fly, like I could do anything. And I just, I just relaxed back and I enjoyed the rest of the float and it was blissful. And ever since then, I've had the key. Hmm. It's the key. It's this, the key meaning like I am no longer beholden to my physiologic response to stress. I now know the power of my thoughts, the power of my beliefs, the power of my willingness to choose how I want my present moment reality to be. Mm. And once I got that, like life for me now, since that float has taken on new proportions of uh, quality. Take it a sound, or you can home. And for those of you that do have an instrument, let's start playing it just very lightly, just sort of experimenting with those sounds and we'll see what happens. That's that's a fascinating story, and I had a fantastic experience in my three floats as well. You know that withdrawal from the senses—they call it pratyahara in yoga. I mean, that's it's the best way that I know of to where you can really get it, because gravity's even—it's not totally gone, but it's significantly reduced when you're right. floating in the salt. So it's just right. it's just you and your sensations, and you get to have your own experience with that very personal and I had I had a recall of of my birth I could remember being in in the hospital and hearing the doctors and nurses talking about it and I could remember the walls and I mean I don't know if you know this is actually what it looked like you know it could have been my own constructive memories but um, it felt very comforting like and it felt like my memories were were around that birth experience, and I remember just being very comforted by it, and and feeling like just the deepest state of relaxation I've I've ever had. Yeah, and it's cool because it's not like a claustrophobic type experience. You know, you're not in a mummy sarcophagus. You're in this big, wide tank that you can just really spread out and relax in. Right. Yeah. Right. And some folks that that come to me and many folks come to me to get over anxiety and claustrophobia and those kinds of um, life limiting um, influences on their, on their quality of life. Uh, they, they just float with the door open or with the door cracked and 99% of them will actually close the door after a couple of minutes and they'll be like, Oh, wait a minute. That, this isn't so bad. This is actually really easy. Yeah. Really when, enjoyable. When you know you've got control over it, that the anxiety eases off. Right. Well, we'd also be remiss if we didn't talk about the didgeridoo. We should talk about that because it's just cool. Tell me about your experience with that. I was on the island of Bali and I was doing Julia Cameroon's The Artist's Way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got a copy of that. Yeah, she's yep. got a great workbook. Um, you know, it's a it's a I don't know, thirty day or maybe it's a three month long workbook where you do these writings in the morning and you really tap into your inner artist and yep. uh, and and one of the things that she says you go once a week for an hour take yourself on an artist date where you don't talk to people, all you do is you choose one thing to do with yourself and you go do it. So I'm on Bali, which is, I mean, the magical island of creativity bursting forth. And, and, I'm, and I'm just going, simple date. I'm just going to go to the beach. I'm going to take a walk on the beach for an hour and then come back. And on my way to the beach, I happen upon these, these teenage boys making these very interesting sticks of wood. Um, and, they're, and they're hollowing them out. So I say to them, I say, what are you guys doing? And, and they say, you wait for boss. You wait for boss. <laughs> they don't speak English, but they just say, you, you wait for boss. So I waited for the boss. 
you know, expecting a guy in a suit, you know, an adult in a suit to, to come on for about 20 minutes. And my curiosity just, just, you know, I was like, all right, forget about the date. You know, I'm hanging out with these kids and I'm seeing what these things are. I was so curious. 20 minutes later, the boss comes, which is another teenage kid with long hair and cut off shorts. And he takes one of these sticks of wood. He props it up into the corner of a room to get the kind of reverb off of, off of the corner. And he kneels over a djembe drum and he props the didge up on the drum and he plays the didgeridoo for me for about, I don't know, it could have been five minutes, it could have been 50 minutes. But once again, my body was electric. It was that 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 electric feeling that I knew that I needed to find out what this instrument was about and I needed to play it. Uh, it, it was incredible. The guy was making sounds and rhythm patterns that just ro- transported me to another dimension. Um, so I, I asked him if he'd make me one. He made me one. He taught me how to play it. Um, and the, pretty much the first and only lesson I ever got, I'll give to to you and anybody else who's listening right now because it's a very easy instrument to play. Okay. Um, and so he pointed at me. He pointed at the at the didgeridoo. He lifted his shoulders, I have to say. This is the easiest thing in the world. And he made a raspberry sound like this. <laughs> That's it? That's it. Yeah? That's it. <laughs> That's it. Now there are all these great lessons online. A lot of it's free. And, you know, if anyone wants to learn how to play the didgeridoo, you can learn so easily and so quickly online. And then the more time you spend with it, the cooler the sound gets and the better the sound gets and, you know, you know, and stuff. So, so then, you know, it was, this was kind of pre-internet um, boom, or it was as the boom was happening, but there wasn't much information about how to play didge out there. So that was the first lesson. And for the first three years, I never heard another didgeridoo after that. Uh-huh. I just would, would play every day. I would play every day. I would play every day. And it felt so good to me to play. It felt so good. It, and now in hindsight, I realized that it, it was embodying for me. It, it helped me to really stay in my body. And that was my pranayama. Like that was my qigong. That that was my learning about breath control and you know learning how to how different breath patterns affect uh, my well being, really. And you know when I do different patterns of breathing and different rhythms of playing on the didgeridoo, I think I'm consciously releasing different biochemicals in my brain that oh, yeah. make me feel a certain way. Yeah. Just just like in yoga, uh, you know in qigong tai chi and you know any other any other system so so i would just i would just play i would just play and play and play and play and play and um then when i got to the eslin institute i um i i got my heart broken it's so funny because so many times i've got my heart broken in my life i'm total i'm a total lover and uh, i love to love and be loved and many times i i i the love was uh Irrefuted or, or, or unrequited. Uh, uh, unrequited. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, right. thanks, thanks, thanks. Unrequited. Oh, yeah. and, and so this is another time that my love was un, unrequited. And um and it's another it's it, it's another flip the reality story because you know it was another you know, again I said to myself, I, I'm not gonna let this get me down. I'm not gonna let this get the better of me. I'm gonna just play my sadness through the didgeridoo. Play my sadness. So it was like the next level. You know, the first level was was um, I'm gonna go into the feeling of anxiety in my belly that I told you about. Yeah. Now it was the emotion. So it was like, oh, I'm feeling so sad, I'm feeling hurt, I'm feeling angry, I'm gonna play it. So I started playing it through the didgeridoo and I would go down to the Esalen hot tubs, um, you know, which if you look at the website, you'll see they have world-class hot springs, hot mineral springs that are built into the side of the cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And there's a silent side that's encased in concrete and glass with uh, yeah, 10 massage tables and, and, and two community tubs that you know 12 or 15 people can fit in each tub. So, so I go in, in and I'm playing and I go at a time of night where nobody's there. And I close my eyes, I start playing the sadness and I'm playing, I'm playing, I open my eyes and there are like you know, 10 or 15 people there listening, moving, massaging. And I stop playing and they're like, no, 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 keep playing, please keep playing. So... 
I went down every single night, every single night, and I wound up, and and more people will come, more people will come, more people will come. So for a couple weeks, I, I was I was playing the sadness. I was going down every single night. People were loving it, and 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 ironically. I met my wife. We got together, like you know, the first night that we got together. It was within those couple of weeks, right after I got my heart broken, and I didn't let it get me down. And I played the sadness, and I, I manifested or attracted my true love. I attracted her. It was almost as if that that was my that was my mating call of sorts. You know, it was like in in, in really staying with the truth of my essence. You know, and 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 not letting the sadness pull me down the rabbit hole, but being empowered by it and making art from it, making music from it, you know, actually attracted into my life what I was really searching for my whole life, which was deep connection and deep love. Um, and, and, and I got it. So, so back to the didgeridoo. So I played every Wednesday night at the Esalen hot tubs uh, from 2003 till, till I left in 2008. And then in 2008, I um, I trained somebody else to play the didgeridoo during, and, and, and then he took it over and then somebody else joined them and now they're doing it. So to this day, since 2003, so that's um, 10, 12 years, yeah. every Wednesday night you can go down and hear the didgeridoo meditation down at the Esalen Baths from 9.30 till 11 o'clock at night. And when I do the math, there's been over 25,000 people that have been to that meditation listening to the, listening to the didgeridoo. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. It's inspiring. And so now you play it here in Asheville, right? I do. Every Friday, um, we offer to the community. It's a donation-based class at Asheville Community Yoga. It's um, restorative yoga, so it's a way to relax and get the nervous system to a deeply relaxed and regulated place while I play the didgeridoo and other bells and, and bowls over, over people. It's a, it's a soundscape, a sound journey. Yeah. Yeah, I also have a recording in 2008, right before I left, I, I professionally recorded the didgeridoo meditation at the Esalen Institute, and it's actually sold several thousand copies since then, um, and, is a, and is a fun little part of my, of my life right now, having, having made that CD. Wow, Corey, what an awesome story. Thank you so much for coming out and, and sharing that with us. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks for inviting me to come out and uh, thanks for the opportunity and thank you so much for the work that you're doing and pioneering with people. Well, thanks. How do we get a hold of you? Tell us about that. Yeah. So I spend most of my time at Still Point Wellness in Asheville, North Carolina. The website, stillpointwell.com. Stillpointwell.com. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Corey. And I uh, appreciate you coming and sharing that with us. And have a great time playing the didgeridoo today. All right. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, that was my conversation with Corey Costanzo. Man, what a nice guy. And what an awesome, inspiring story. Thanks to him for coming out and sharing with us. Really appreciate it. So I hope you got something out of the podcast, Anecdotal Evidence. We've got new episodes coming out every week. So tune in, danjohnsonmd.com slash podcast. Really got some great guests coming up. So thanks again for listening. Until next time, this is Daniel Johnson MD. Take care.